Now, Muhammad, he was shyer than a veiled virgin girl. That's what the Hadith tells us, and there are lots of other pearls. This shy guy, he raped and killed and wanted his critics dead. When they were killed, he didn't mourn, he celebrated instead. This is the guy they want you, think, want you to think is God's most perfect man. If you believe that, then you'll also believe that I am Tarzan. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to This Week in Jihad with the great David Wood. Hello, David. Hello, Robert. Good to be here with the uh, poet laureate of the entire world right now. <laughs> you know, we look back to the great times and we're like, ah, Alfred Lord Tennyson with the Charge of the Light Brigade. And you got this guy with uh, his poem Horatius. And we had Robert Frost and a T.S. Eliot. And what do we have now? We got Robert Spencer. <laughs> The greatest who ever did it, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, we're in trouble now, ladies and gentlemen. It's just part of the decline of civilization, but that's for another show. This show is about another kind of declining civilization, Islam and Jihad. And in its death throes, it is dangerous, just like a wounded snake. So, and the, it, didn't Muhammad say something like that, that it's going to go back to its hole like a snake? Yep. There you go. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, are. You know, it's, by the way, you know what's interesting about that? Because you got you got all these hadiths, and it sounds like Islam's going to conquer the world. And then you got these other hadiths where eh, Islam's going to be so weak, it just crawls back into the hole like a snake. Mm -hmm. It's like you have all these hadiths that say like every possible scenario of something that could happen. I happen to have a book about that. Yeah, I know. And, <laughs> and but it's funny because. So no matter what happens, Muslims can always point to a hadith. If Islam uh, grows rapidly, they say, you see, just like you said. And if it's, uh, it, it shrivels up and crawls back into its hole, they'll say, you see, it's exactly as Muhammad said. Yep. No matter what happens, no matter what happens. Why? Because they were making up hadith when Islam was in a bunch of different situations in the world. So David, uh, you know, I, I got to send you a copy because uh, I actually only have, I think, one left. I got to get some more. But, oh, yeah, get uh, it. I only have I I I got to send you one because we have to have our Titanic debate. The Muslim uh, you know, dabagandists will all see. Wow, rational people debating. It's a, it's a whole new concept. You know, I already have my uh, reading schedule laid out for the next several months wow. of various things that I had uh, agreed to review and comment on and stuff like that. Uh, so the debate would have to be at least a few months down the road. However, you've got a new book, so we might want to do, uh, like a live stream on my show, uh, on my channel here in the very near future, like maybe next week or something where you basically run down. I can, I'll ask you some questions and stuff about it, but, uh, you basically, uh, lay out the thesis of your book and some of your arguments and go through some of your points. We can, uh, tell people where to get it and so on. And then a few months down the road, we'll have our debate where you'll be humiliated. But at least by then, people will have bought the book before they realize that it's been thoroughly crushed by me. Okay. Well, that sounds like a deal. That sounds mm -hmm. like the best deal since the angel Seraphel appeared to Kutam. So we got lots of jihad here, ladies and gentlemen. And so I thought that we should start off with a story. Now, see, I, I have this problem again of organization of where to find once I get all the stories together. You know, I spend a couple hours every Wednesday morning getting all the stories together, but then I, I can't find them because there's so many. I've, I've seen your, aside. I've seen your, yeah, I've seen your, uh, I've seen your browser with the tabs. Like if you just have a couple tabs open, you can still see what you can see what they are. If yeah. you have 50 tab, if you have 50 tabs open, you can't tell what anything is without clicking on it. Okay. And that's a perfectly reasonable point. But what's the alternative? If I want to set aside 50 stories to talk to you about, then I can either open 50 windows or have 50 tabs. Either way, it's going to end up being hard to find. Mm -hmm. That is a problem. So it's just you, an ongoing and, mystery for me. And if you're, ask, if you're asking me about tech stuff, you're asking the wrong guy. But uh, someone, someone, someone who knows a, a way of uh, organizing massive amounts of stuff for purposes of live stream... Uh, explain a better way in the comments section afterwards. Yeah. And then, Robert, you, then you could check it out afterwards. And speaking of comments, I have this one here from John Wilson. I pre-ordered my copy of Muhammad, a critical biography. Still waiting for it to arrive. That's because it's not quite out yet. I got some advanced copies because that's what they do. They send the author what 10 
10 copies and they're almost all gone, but I got to get one to David so that he can humiliate me later. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it's, they're going to start shipping on the 10th. So that is six days from now. You should get it soon after that. In the meantime, I found our man here. This is Joshua Robles. And, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Joshua Robles. Only from your tweet. Oh yeah. Well, Joshua converted to Islam a few oh, years good. back and, good. uh, Probably everybody around him congratulated themselves on how they were not Islamophobic and so on. Mm -hmm. He yep. is a young man in Las Vegas, and uh, he looks a little... People were saying he looks older, but I don't really necessarily think so. He just has facial hair. He's 16, according to the cops. And uh, he was plotting to uh, carry out jihad attacks in the Las Vegas area. And he's pretty hardcore. He was jailed for this plan to carry out an ISIS attack in Las Vegas, okay? And they thought that he was so dangerous that the prosecutors asked him, asked that he get a million dollar bail. Hmm. And the, pro the judge, one of these judges, David, said, oh no, the poor thing, a million dollars, that's way too much. Let's make it 10,000. Oh, good idea. And so they decided to make the bail 10000 But then they found in his jail cell that he had handwritten an ISIS flag and had written on it, Death to Jews, and hmm. Welcome with Death. Well, <laughs> so, and, you, and you know what the government did then? Well, I'll let this guy out for free. Well, we'll release this guy on his per own personal recognizance there because uh, he hates Jews. Yep. And so uh, they actually, to their credit, in this one case, they actually did raise the bail to a million. And so he is still in jail, uh, old Joshua Robles. But he is a convert to Islam. M Muslim parents don't name their children Joshua. So uh, what is this all about, David? Why is it that so many converts to Islam seem to get the idea they ought to go jihad? Yeah, uh, well, you know, people like you and uh, I have said for years um, that they convert to Islam, they they believe whatever lies are being told to them by the online dawah crew who tell them, hey, you should convert to Islam because of the amazing scientific miracles, because of the miraculous preservation, and because of this and that. They don't bother to research it. They assume these other, they assume these recruiters are telling them the truth. They convert to Islam and then they find out, oh, if you really want to get in good with Allah, then you have to go violently subjugate the entire world. Then they do it and everyone, uh, it becomes a complete mystery to them. Yeah. Um, this person must, this person must have uh, some mental problem that just suddenly kicks in right when they convert to Islam. Yep. And it happens again and again and again. There's an ongoing phenomenon that we have documented extensively in this program, and you can read more about it at jihadwatch.org, that many, many converts to Islam go jihad, and yet nowhere do authorities care. Nowhere are they studying this phenomenon. David, I got another question from the comments here. Guys, you don't do super chats? Why don't we do super chats on this channel? Yeah, uh, because Robert... Uh, exposes jihad, his channel cannot be monetized. That's something you're not allowed to do. So you can support him in other ways. One, you could definitely uh, buy his uh, buy his books, not just his new one. I can't comment. I can't comment on that. It might. It may be the worst book uh, ever. Although I have to say, Robert has a pretty darn good track record of putting out really good books. Uh, so, but everyone, everyone, everyone who's interested in watching this right now definitely needs uh the history of jihad and the critical quran um and of course robert's new book so anyway you can help out robert uh support his work by buying his books and you can uh he, he's got a he's got a uh page on patreon you can support him on patreon so that's just what that's just what you have to do if uh youtube won't allow you to have super chats and so on. So we can't have fun with super chats here. I apologize for that. Complain to on. YouTube. I don't know. Would that help, David? If people started writing to YouTube and said, "Hey, ease up on this guy. He's not, no, not but, a terrible no, person." No, but 
No, but you might be blacklisted for stuff like in the past. You know what I mean? Like you might be on a list just like don't ever monetize this guy, even though they might be okay with that. Because I mean, me and AP talk about jihad all the time, and mm -hmm. we're not banned anymore. So I don't know if they've changed. You might want to. You might want to just make a make a new channel or something like that. Or we could always try Rumble. That might be fun. It's worth a try. I I, I think it's probably because of the. Uh the Southern Poverty Law Center list and because of being banned in Britain. And those things, of course, also came from telling the truth about jihad that they don't want known. And speaking of telling the truth about jihad that they don't want known, an uh, interesting thing happened out of Facebook today, just today. And uh, this was the meta company that runs Facebook. They have been deliberating about this for weeks and they just made the decision, David, they decided that from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free is not hate speech and will not be penalized. So I'm sure you're going to go right onto your Facebook account and write about this. Are you not? Uh, I, don't, I don't have a Facebook account. And why is that? Uh, this was uh, several years ago, but they would uh, they started banning almost everything I would post. I would say I would just take a screenshot of a death threat from a Muslim and I would say, look at what this guy posted uh, to me. And they would ban me for hate speech for say for reporting what the other guy said. This guy threatened my life. I would share it and they would ban me one time. One time there's this famous there's this famous picture of that guy who was at like a shipyard when in, in World War II when the Nazis showed up and they told everyone to salute and he just sits there with his arms yeah. crossed. He refuses. Everyone around him is doing the, the, the salute except this one guy who's just looking like he's not interested in being there. Anyway, I posted a picture. I had a circle around that. and I said, be this guy, <laughs> right? Yep. Be the guy who wouldn't salute. They banned me for hate speech for that. I mean, they didn't ban me off yeah. the platform, but they, you know, they put me in their little prison where you have to wait seven days or whatever it was. Anyway, I just got to the point where I was like, why, why am I doing this? Uh, I can do other things. Yeah. And so I got off. And so, in other words, opposing jihad got you harassed so much on Facebook that eventually you gave up. Whereas this frankly genocidal chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. And we all and we all know what that we all know what that means. There have been attempts by people in America, politicians and so on in America to say, oh, no, it's just calling for freedom for all people. No, it's not. We know what that we know what that means. It means completely wiping Israel off the map. We know what that means. Yep, we certainly do. But Facebook doesn't care. Facebook is much more concerned. I actually had the same experience as you did, David. Uh, uh, I hung out on Facebook as long as I could, but ultimately they were flagging everything. I was getting banned all the time. And one time, the uh, son of Ramazan Kadyrov, the Chechen strongman, beat up a guy who was already in prison for desecrating the Quran. And Ramazan Kadyrov's son went into the prison and started beating this guy bloody. And it was a video that was widely circulated on Twitter. So I put it up at Jihad Watch with a still photo from the video of the one guy hitting the other. It was just, that's it, one guy hitting another. And it was banned for pornography. And I thought, yeah, see, he was wearing short sleeves. So you could see his whole arm. It, yeah. it, it's terrible. Yeah, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good summary. It's, it's that... Um, a lot of these platforms will make rules that seem reasonable, but they, the pe at the end of the day, it's people who are enforcing these rules and mm -hmm. the people will completely, will apply them to anything. So they'll make a rule, no pornography say, oh, that's a, that's a good rule. But then they'll say, oh, this person, po I'll just say it's pornography just so I can ban this guy. Mm -hmm. So you have, in other words, you have, uh, you have a team of people who are controlling the content and they really love jihad there they really love jihad and they do not like anyone exposing jihad so crap platform yeah. i was probably i was thinking that it was likely that i was getting reported for every last possible thing you could report people for under any pretext so somebody just decided to say that this uh, image of this short-sleeved individual was pornographic and that was that Anyway, uh, I'm not there anymore, and you hey. shouldn't be either. Yes. Hey, you should go back on and post a picture of Muhammad Hijab after he pulled off his shirt for everyone <laughs> and see if that gets banned for being porn, and that would be funny. You say no, Muhammad, yeah, yeah. Muhammad, Hij Muhammad Hijab is now a porn star. 
Yes. Well, that's that's probably something he would have no trouble being. Uh, he'd be very happy to do. Anyway, um, we have very somber news out of Nigeria. A summary piece, uh, a survey indicated that um, not only has there been all the violent jihad that we have documented for so long here, but also many people, so many people have been displaced that now, uh, according to Open Doors, the, uh, the in organization that works to protect persecuted Christians, 16 million, no fewer than 16,200,000 Christians have been forcibly driven from their homes by Islamic jihadis and are now in uh, displaced person camps. Uh, in Nigeria and in the surrounding nations. Now, why, David, would jihadis want to drive people from their homes? Um, Islam wants to keep expanding. Nigeria is right on the line. There's actually a name for the line. I forget what it's called. But uh, people who actually do the research, there's a there's a line that basically goes around the Muslim world that separates it from the non-Muslim world. In other words, you, there's, there's, it, it's not an official line. It's like an imaginary line. But there's basically Muslim majority on one side of the line, some other Hindu majority or Christian majority or something on the other side of the line. And Islam just wants to keep on pushing people farther and farther back, making people leave their homes and so on. Keep pushing it back until you push through the entire country over the period of 50 years or 100 years or however long it takes. But they got the, they got the long-term goal in mind. And that's what happened to every country you can name that's majority Muslim. There were invading armies. They took over an area. They took over another area. They carried out ethnic cleansing or uh, the subjugation under the Dimi laws of the native population until ultimately the, uh, there was a tiny minority of non-Muslims left. Most of them had been driven out or forcibly converted. And now we have the Islamic world. And they're still at it to create more of it. So in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Central Africa, interesting story out of there, David, the Allied Democratic Forces, which is a very benign name for an Islamic State ISIS group, in uh, the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo, in North Kivu, they struck there, and it's interesting to note that uh, one of the survivors said this, it was chaos, people screaming and trying to escape. Those who did not survive were killed, and the rebels could utter the word Bismillah while killing our innocent Christians. Now, why on earth would they utter Bismillah in the name of Allah while they're committing murder. They must be misunderstanding Islam, uh, surely in this case. Well, it's called uh, fighting in the way of Allah. So you want to make it, you want to make it clear, especially, especially since every Western journalist is hell bent on saying, oh, it's, it's, it's some other reason they're fighting. It's because of some other cause. It has to be something else. These guys get frustrated. It's like, how can we make our point any clearer? Why do you think we scream Allahu Akbar while we're killing people? So you guys can't misrepresent it and say it's over something else. We want, in other words, from a Western perspective, it's like the worst possible motive you could have for going around killing people would be doing it for your, for your gut. Whereas for them, it's the greatest possible motive. And so they want to make it crystal clear that they're doing this for their God. And that's what happens. Indeed. And so even though they make it clear, this will still not be reported in the establishment media. My source on this story is International Christian Concern, which is a very good group that tracks the persecution of Christians. But they report this sort of thing. When the massacre was reported, which it got very scant reporting in the establishment media, it was not mentioned that they were saying Bismillah while they were killing people. In Burkina Faso, 100, peop 100 Christians have been killed in the last six months, and three months, I'm sorry, and in one incident, one particularly dreadful incident just last Sunday, uh, they captured 26 Christians in Sanaba, in the western part of Burkina Faso, and took them to a church where they cut their throats. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what is that all about? Surely uh, this must be some kind of extremist Islam that's hijacking the the real thing, no? Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, I'm just going to have to say, yeah, total uh, in, insane extremist <laughs> stuff. <laughs> they took them to the church, most likely to emphasize that they believe that the church is a center of uh, shirk, that is association of partners with Allah, and then that would justify their killing them uh, as they have been commanded to fight against those who uh, uh, whose religion is not all for Allah. So. Well, there's that too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I got a story here out of New Jersey. This guy, uh, this, this imam here. What's his name? Let me get his name here. Uh, Imam Khalil Adam out of, out of Flanders, New Jersey. Flanders? Where's Flanders? I don't know. I've never been there. But uh, the one thing I can tell you about this guy, he's preaching Friday sermon at the Islamic Society of North Jersey. And he says, uh, I don't, you know, anyway, he says, I somehow don't think he has the New Jersey accent. He says that uh, we know the aggression, he's talking about the Jews, that they have come with, and we know their downfall. We know the verses, that is, of the Quran, and Allah says they will be destroyed in the end. At the end, their time will come, and the Muslims will be the ones to do it. What do you think? Surely this must be extremist. Uh, no, because it's a Muslim. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's where, like, did, where does it like, get this idea? Uh, you? <laughs> it's got to be you, it, right? Man. That's it's where all, that's be. where all the. That's where all these guys go to get their ideas, right? I mean, I mean, think, you say, here's what they believe, and then they believe it. So obviously they got it from you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's actually what they tell you in the, uh, know. you know, the Islamophobia manuals and so on. That uh, they, It's very common. It goes back years. We, mm -hmm. uh, the an imam says something, we quote it. It's fine when the imam says it, but when we quote it, then it's Islamophobia. So it's no doubt an act of Islamophobia that I'm saying this to you right now, that this imam said this in Jersey. But uh, what is he referring to? Can you illuminate it all? Uh, they will be destroyed in the end. At the end, their time will come, and the Muslims will be the ones to do it. Um, I mean, you, you have... Uh, again, I, I mentioned earlier that you have, uh, you know, apart from the little hadith where Islam's going to crawl back into its hole like a like the snake that it is, like the slithery snake that it is. Um, you have all these predictions about Islam taking over the world and all religion will be for Allah. And Muhammad said, I've been shown the east of the east and the west of the west, and I have seen that Islam rules over all of it. So this is a prophecy. Um with uh, with the Jews, with the Jews, they are uh, Muslims are told that the, they're going to fight the Jews, and until the Jews are hiding behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees are are crying out, uh, "Hey, Muslim, there's a there's a Jew behind me, come kill him," and so on. And so this is all built into Islam, and somehow, somehow, when someone says it, "Hey, we're going to conquer these people, we're going to uh, subjugate these people," everyone's shocked. Where's he getting this extremism from? Uh, his prophet. Yep, that couldn't be it. Nope. Is God? But that's it. The uh, the Hadith says the rocks and the trees are going to cry out. The stones will cry out and say that there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. So the Muslims are going to be the ones to do away with the Jews at the at the end of the world. This is something that is in canonical Hadiths. Uh, but David, this is all very Islamophobic, and this is a UK Secretary of State. The UK has several secretaries of state, I understand, for different things. but And this one, I don't know her name. If anybody knows uh, her name, please put it in the chat or uh, let me know somehow so that uh, I can start to try to find out more about her. But it's interesting that this week the UK government is working to criminalize Islamophobia. 
Well, that's and good. So, yeah, yeah, about, finally. About time. About time. Exactly. So uh, this guy stands up in Parliament and he says, uh, would you please be so kind as to give us a definition of Islamophobia? No and chance. The Secretary of State stood up and she said, actually, you know, we're working on this. And we're working on it quite assiduously, but she never did get around to giving an actual uh, uh, definition. So I see that this is Angela Rayner, and she yeah. is a uh, she doesn't know what Islamophobia is, but she is working to criminalize it. And so uh, it's a good thing that uh, she's going to take care of that for us. That is funny because uh, I mean, you said, and she was asked, and I was like, "No chance." It's like you can't, you can't, <laughs> say, you can't say, "Here's what Islamophobia is," because if you said it in any in any sane sense, in other words, if you are making any sane rule against what you're calling Islamophobia, it would have to be something like. If you're in a constant state of panic because you think that Muslims are hiding behind everything and they're coming to sabotage you and anything that goes wrong in your life, you're thinking, oh, it must be Muslims behind the scenes and so on. Uh, if you wanted to if you wanted to say that's a problem, then you could make it. But that's that's never how they that's never how they apply it. They say, oh, yeah. you criticized Muhammad for ordering his followers to kill apostates. Oh, you criticized Muhammad for having sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl. Oh, you, you made fun of Muhammad for taking the wife of his own adopted son. Oh, you criticize Islam because it calls for your violent subjugation and the annihilation of Jews and the destruction of your societies. And, and you actually have the gall to respond to it. The Quran calls Jews and Christians the worst of creatures. And some of you actually have the nerve to say, that it's wrong. This is Islamophobe. That's how Islamophobia actually gets applied in the real world. Mm -hmm. But if you were to say that, if you were to say, well, Islamophobia is anytime you criticize Islam for uh, killing apostates, child marriage, any of that stuff, you cannot be allowed to say that. They would sound like complete lunatics and she knows it. So the question is, how do you phrase it in some way that can actually make it through and get passed into law even though you want to apply it in a completely insane fashion to get more people locked up and to get more uh uh child molesters and rapists and so on out of prison let them go let the jihadis go all the people you locked up for uh supporting isis let them go and replace them with people who criticize isis and islam and all these things that's really what it's about because uh actually it's a trick islamophobia is a trick it's a sleight of hand. What, you, what it's sold to the public as is we're going to protect Muslims from vigilante attacks. We're mm -hmm. going to protect them on the streets from being attacked by far-right, uh, white supremacists, right-wing extremists, all that nonsense. And that's, that's great. Nobody objects to that. Nobody has any problem with protecting people, innocent people, from being attacked by vigilantes or thugs or creeps or whatever. But once it's sold to the public in that way, then it becomes exactly what David is saying here. It becomes a vehicle to silence any negative, any negative word about Islam, any opposition to jihad violence, any opposition to Sharia oppression. It's all gone under the guise of protecting Muslims from attacks. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, interesting story out of Germany in Zechlendorf. Der uh, Führer was very popular in Zechlendorf. And now they are his sons and children and heirs, but they are, they are not Germans, they are Arabs. In any case, uh, what we have in Zechlendorf, Nurhan B., they never give the last name, he uh, uh, attacked his ex-girlfriend on the sidewalk in front of her house. He ambushed her and he uh, fatally stabbed her to death. And interesting thing, David, about this, he did not scream Allahu Akbar, but he was screaming something during the, uh, during the attack. Now, it's noteworthy. It's not even, you know, by the Quran of Mecca that there was a little bit of a fad for in France. It was something completely new. 
And so I'll just tell you because there's no point there's in no guessing. Way we know. Mm -hmm. Could be anything. Yeah. He says, I have the right to do this. And that's what he was screaming as he stabs his ex to death on the sidewalk in Zetlendorf. Did he have the right to do it? Um, you, there are there are a number of ways you could uh, you could argue that. Um, so you could you could put her in the uh, apostate category, the unbeliever category, uh, anything you want to, anything you want to argue, you can you can come up with an Islamic justification for uh, for stabbing someone. Yeah, he uh, it, the story actually out of the uh, the German press here. It's the Berliner Zeitung, they say it's an honor killing, that he killed her to restore his honor because he was enraged that mm -hmm. she had left him. And certainly there, uh, there is abundant precedent for that, is there not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, uh, we've, we've talked about this before, but, uh, you know, honor killings, there, there were, that was a cultural issue even before Islam, but Islam just, Islam just made it defensible. It made it more defensible by making it this horrible thing that if a woman is disobeying a man or a daughter is disobeying her parents or uh, you can, there are always, there, there are always Islamic penalties. If, if, if your wife is disobedient, you can always beat her and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you want to, you can say, hey, you're not following this rule, this rule, this rule. Surah 4 verse 65 says that if you don't fully submit to all of Muhammad's decisions, you're not a Muslim. So I say you're not a Muslim. Or if, uh, if you, if you're just an unbeliever, then, you know, you can strike at their neck. So there, there, are, there are all kinds, there are always all kinds of justifications um, yes. for, uh, for this. And at the end of the day, you can always make something up and say, eh, eh, she, uh, she tore up a Quran. So I, uh, brutally murdered her in the name of Allah. And you can, plenty of justifications for violence. In Islam. That would certainly fly in an Islamic country. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, I got another story out of Iran, 17 year old girl killed by her father in the province of Ilam. Uh, and the human rights organization in Iran says it was an honor killing. The girl, uh, was named Mon Bobina, Zayin Ivand, and she was from Gorzalnagar village in the uh, Majin district of Darashir city. Uh, her father apparently shot her with a shotgun uh, in order to restore the family honor because she had been in a relationship with a boy of whom he did not approve. Mm -hmm. And so instead of uh, talking to the girl and... Um taking steps to make sure uh, she understands what her obligations are and so on, and just, and just blow her away with a shotgun. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question will be now, will we see the Islamic Republic prosecute this man for murder, or will he get off? Because in all too many Islamic countries, there are reduced penalties and sometimes no penalties at all for honor killings. And... Um... Armin Navabi, Armin Navabi, he's a ex-Muslim atheist, uh, but mm -hmm. he he's really knows his stuff on Iran. He's pointed out that you have the uh, you have the population, the broader population that is, that is turned against the uh, the religious rulers and so on. He says basically the only group that still supports the current regime is like the hardline Muslims, the really hardcore Muslims who are still, you know, obsessed with the Mahdi and uh, subjugating the world and all this stuff. And uh, they're actually trying to bring about the, uh, the, you know, the return of the, the, the caliph and I mean, the, 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 uh, the 12th Imam and so on. They're trying to bring all this uh, about. So those are the kind of the last group that's really strongly supports the regime. But those are the exact kind of guys who would support honor killing. So you can't really come against some of these things that we think of as extreme. You can't come against them when the only guys who are supporting you anymore are the extremists. Exactly. Very interesting dilemma they've got there. Uh, and it's only going to get worse as the regime continues to erode uh, its own support by striking terror in its own population, because that's the only weapon it's got to try to control the protests. The Quran says strike terror in the enemies of Allah, but the more they do it, the more they make people hate the regime. So it's a vicious circle. All right, back to Germany. We got a story out of Waltershausen 
in Thuringia. Uh, we have a Somali who entered a supermarket, and he was apparently looking for trouble. He started to cough on people and irritate them, uh, annoying them, and some guy asked him to stop. And when he uh, asked him to stop, the coffer grew enraged, pulled a knife, and he stabbed him. Where did he stab him, David? Uh, I'll go with neck for 200. Neck for 200 it is. And he, uh, he then threatened others there, threatened other customers, and uh, injured another man slightly in with his knife, said, I will kill you and your families. And he's looking at 15 years prison, and after that he'll be fine. Am I right? He'll become a loyal, stable, productive member of German society. Yep. 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 After all those years of uh, prison dawa, and uh, yep. Yep. And meanwhile, we have in Munich, we have a group of Afghan migrants, and they call themselves the Kings of Munich. And uh, it's very interesting because they are uh, threatening to cut off the heads of enemies of Islam. And a uh, TV station recently went in to this area and they started interviewing these guys. And they said, hey, because they're Afghans, you know, what do you think of the Taliban? Because these are people who supposedly fled to Germany to, to get refuge from the Taliban, okay? So they flee, they, 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 and, and they're in Germany. The TV guy asks them, what do you think of the Taliban? The guy says, the Islamic Emirate of the Taliban is definitely better. There's no more war, no more theft, nothing. If thieves are caught, their hands are cut off. And so the TV interviewer, who was, was, was no, no mean intellect, he said, well, then why did you come to Germany? Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you like the Good Taliban. Question. And, and he says, uh, uh, they, they said they came to Germany for Islamic reasons. I mean, I'm sorry, for economic reasons, excuse me, mm. economic reasons. But then one of them says, if Germany becomes and remains Islamic, then everything will be very good. Mm -hmm. It sure will. Just like in Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these other Sharia compliant hell holes that everyone wants to flee. Isn't that crazy, though? Because, you know, these these guys saying economic reasons, you know, when they were uh, uh, when they were uh, seeking asylum or whatever, they were, oh, please save us, save us from the Taliban. They're going to kill us all because because we support we, we support the West so much. We're not safe here. They're going to kill us. And Western nations. Are, oh, OK, bring them, bring them here. Yes, yes. Bring these bring these poor suffering souls here and they get here. Ha ha. We're going to take over here. We love the Taliban. It's great. And we need to make Germany the Taliban. That's it. And, and people so never learn. Germany is well on its way. And because they're not learning, they just call anybody who opposes them Nazis and they just keep going. And again, this was, we've talked about this before, but that was uh, Hitler's ultimate dream. He believed that uh, the people of Germany were racially superior to everyone else and they were they were totally capable of conquering the world, but they had the wrong ideology. They had Christianity, which doesn't mm -hmm. encourage conquering. And so Hitler lamented, why, why didn't we have the religion of the Muslims? If we'd only, if we'd combine our race, which he viewed as racially inferior, he viewed the Arabs mm -hmm. as racially inferior, but he viewed their ideology as the correct ideology as far as this will, this will, this is what will subjugate the world. Uh, the reason they hadn't is because they had an inferior race, according to him. So he said, if you combine the German race, the German people with that ideology, it will dominate the entire world. Didn't happen in his lifetime, but it's happening in ours, Robert. Yep. I see the uh, Vogue that Hitler is enjoying uh, on Twitter. And, uh, of course, all the Muslims love that because they loved Hitler from the start with uh, the, the Mufti of Jerusalem living in Berlin and working for the Nazis during World War II. And uh, he made broadcasts in Arabic trying to recruit people into uh, supporting the Germans. So maybe we will see what uh, Hitler thought was going to happen. Anyway, meanwhile, there is Islamization going on all over the place. And we had an interesting story out of Sweden, Udavalla in Sweden. And uh, this is a place where the social, the Sweden Democrats, rather, not the social Democrats, the Sweden Democrats have uh, political power. 
And so the Sweden Democrats, for those of you who do not know, they are an Islam-aware party. They are against mass Muslim migration into Sweden. And so they are vilified as far right and have been uh, shunned by all the major parties. But their political power continues to grow because the more Sweden slides into chaos, the more people see, oh, the Sweden Democrats were right all along. So anyway, in Uddevalla, they have a majority, and it turned out that there was a problem, a minor problem. The children were not eating the school lunches. And so they thought, what we need is more good old Swedish home cooking. Mm. That is, instead of serving hamburger, oh, no, I don't even know what they were serving. I don't know. Maybe it was falafel or... Swedish um, meatballs? Well, that's what they want, you know, because they're Swedish. So they were putting more Swedish stuff into the canteens, and it turned out a lot of that is pork. Mm. Because that's traditional food in Sweden. And so Mohammed, a high school student in Agneberg school, he says, it feels like those who are non-religious or Christian are given more priority and that we Muslims are being forgotten. And that also leads to exclusion. Yeah. And and it's funny, they always, uh, they always start sounding like uh, leftists when they make their appeals. You don't want to be, you don't want this. This doesn't seem very diverse. Yep. Aren't we all about diversity here? That's what Islam's all about until we take over. But that's what, yeah, we love diversity right for the moment. Mm -hmm. There you go. So Sweden is now, they're enraged, you know, that uh, pork is being served in the schools as if that's the only thing, which it isn't. And so they uh, are agitating that pork be banned from the Swedish schools. And I think the way Sweden's going it's likely that they're going to get that wish fairly soon. But right now in Uddevalla, you can get uh, pork products in the schools and uh, people are not happy. Uh, meanwhile, in Turkey, in Diyarbakir, in eastern Turkey, there was a big brawl in a cafe. And this is a, a screenshot from a video of the brawl. See people fighting outside and there are a couple of cops. Actually, this cop looks pretty useless. He's just standing there while these guys are fighting and looking at his uh, fellow police officer. Um, I'm sorry, I realize that you can't see what I'm pointing at, but if you look at the guy by the car, there's a policeman yeah, in front of the car, and he's standing there kind of idly, and then two guys in front, right in front of him fighting, and another police officer over to the left. Anyway, this was a big fight in a cafe because, David, they were selling alcohol. Mm. And they were serving women who were not wearing hijab. Mm. And so a group of Muslims, and what were they yelling? Uh, Allahu Akbar. How did you know that? You must have know. seen it's this weird, story. Weird. Nope. Haven't, haven't at all. Just a wild, crazy guess. It's, it's wild, clairvoyant powers that you've got. It's astonishing, really, that you would know. But in any case, yes. Uh, that's what they were yelling, and they smashed up the place because they were enraged that alcohol was being sold and that women who were unveiled were being served. And so I think that's the kind of thing Sweden can look forward to. That right now they're whining and sounding like leftists and saying, we're being left out. But uh, after a while, they start to hit. That's what it always comes out to, does it not? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I mean... It, it all, uh, in spite of what you say in your book, according to the Muslim sources, this all goes <laughs> back. This all goes back to Muhammad's methodology. When you're completely outnumbered, hey guys, peace and tolerance, man, peace and tolerance. That's what I'm all about. And then, <laughs> then once your numbers grow, the the approach changes, and once your numbers grow even more, the approach changes again. It's always about what's in the best interest of the ummah. If if screaming, hey, but what about diversity is in the best interest? That's what you scream. If screaming Allahu Akbar while slaughtering people in the name of Allah is uh, in the best interest of the ummah, that's what you do. That's in the book. What do you mean, despite what I write in the book? I'm saying because you probably don't believe that this stuff actually happened. That's why no, I clarified that. According, it's it's in it's still in the sources. So. It's in the sources, yes. Yeah. 
But did the sources actually happen? Nah. Anyway, ha, wait to, just wait till our Titanic Clash of the Titans debate. Uh, all right, we have in, uh, back to Germany. Got to find the guy here. Uh, this is an imam, and he is talking to a group of school children in uh, Stad Tallendorf in Hesse. And he uh, is, you can see they are not Muslim school children because you uh -huh. got all those girls, they are not wearing hijabs. And he yeah, is... Just, just don't, don't try to think about what he's thinking about. That's correct. But what he's mm -hmm. reciting is the Fatiha, mm -hmm. the first surah of the Quran. Now, why would it be foolish for the Germans to allow an imam to come into a school and recite the Fatiha? Well, uh, as you and I know, when uh, at the end of Surat Al Fatiha, so for anyone who's not, that's the first. That's the first surah of the Quran. Muslims uh, recite it seventeen times per day. Um, but in there, there's a little place where it refers to uh, Jews and Christians, where Muslims actually pray. Uh, don't uh, don't don't make us like those upon whom is wrath, or like those who have gone astray. Uh, but when you look up what those phrases referred to, those upon whom is wrath, that ref that's how that was their code for Jews. And those who went astray, that refers to the Christians. And so you can recite these prayers in front of a Christian audience. And if they do not know what is what these things refer to, because they're they're ignorant of what's in the Muslim sources, then imams can actually get away and in many cases even get Christians to recite this prayer, which is saying, please don't make us uh, evil, disgusting Christians or Jews. <laughs> Indeed. And so it's kind of crazy, but uh, so much of this is. And so I wanted Surpri to show. Yep. I'm surprised with all those little girls there. He wasn't quoting uh, Surah 65 verse 4 to them. Yikes. Uh, Surah 65 verse 4 is directions for uh, how you go about getting a divorce. You have to wait, make sure the girl's not pregnant, but then the verse stipulates this holds true. You have to wait anyway, even for uh, girls who have not menstruated. Prepubescent. Mm -hmm. In other words, they are prepubescent girls you're divorcing. You've already married them. You're mm -hmm. divorcing them. Uh, the flip side of this story comes out of Pakistan, and this is the Council on Islamic Ideology. And there they are at one of their meetings. And I'm sorry, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to attend, really. It would, and they even have a chair for us. We could both go. Um, <laughs> but the Council of Islamic Ideology, they had a meeting because a judge in Pakistan recently ruled that the Ahmadiyya have a right to practice their religion. And the Council of Islamic Ooh. Ideology, which is a government organization, in Pakistan, they were enraged. Hmm. And so what they have recommended is that uh, the chief, the, the decision should be reversed. And they said that uh, the Ahmadis, oh, and also even in the decision, uh, it says that they should not be allowed to profess their faith outside their places of worship. But that means they can profess their faith inside their places of worship, you see. And mm -hmm. so the Council of Islamic Ideology says the latter part of paragraph 42 of the decision, which permits Ahmadis to profess or preach within their places of worship, should be reconsidered. They must not be allowed to profess or preach in any manner, even within their houses community centers, or in places of worship. They must not be permitted to profess or preach openly inside their houses or otherwise, as their actions directly desecrate the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Baba, Islam, the Quran, and the Sunnah. Not even in their houses can they preach. Mm -hmm. So in Germany, you got this guy, and he's out there showing how the Jews are, have earned Allah's anger and the Christians have gone astray, and he's teaching little school children this. And in mm -hmm. Pakistan, a minority group is, they're saying, the, the Council of Islamic Ideology, a government organization, saying they can't even preach in their houses. And, uh, you, you, know, it's, you know, it's weird when you were saying, hey, you know, there's a chair there for us, and so on. I was thinking, 
ah, wouldn't it be a wouldn't it be interesting if some of these guys invited us over for a discussion on jihad? And then I thought, what, imagine how that would actually look if, like, they invited you over there. You give a presentation on what jihad is, and they'd be like, "Yeah, hey, he's completely correct. Yeah, 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 good, good, good job, good job, good job. Yep. Outstanding, outstanding, one hundred percent correct yep. <laughs> assessment of jihad, Mister Spencer." Yeah, you know, what we should do is go in disguise. You're very good at disguises. Mm -hmm. We should go over as imams and explain jihad, explain the Quran. They'll all say that we, we have very high degree of knowledge of Islam. And then we reveal, no, after we get out of the country, we reveal our identities. Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm not really Robert al uh Robert Spencer. <laughs> That's it. But we'd really have to brush up um, because Khalid Tantawi, that, there he is, an interesting looking individual. He is a lawmaker in Egypt and he is enraged because there was just a, a, a Quran recitation competition and some people made mistakes mm. and he wants them prosecuted. He yeah. wants the Association of Quran Reciters and Memorizers to introduce rules Mm -hmm. against errors in recitation yeah and i'm saying it's it's not like you know it's not like because with all these different qurans out there it's easy to uh misrecite something but so you don't want to like give them a death penalty or something but public lashings public lashings for misquoting the quran i uh, yeah probably want something like that yeah i thought it was interesting because you know if there were a bible memorization contest that a church held or something the the people who lose are not going to get prosecuted or jailed but uh this guy Khalid Tanto he, he he wants to see that happen in Egypt you don't get the Quran right then you're going to be facing the long arm of the law as you should as you should but meanwhile in Pakistan we had a story of another gentleman named Ali Haider who was imprisoned for life last Thursday imprisoned for life david for desecrating the quran hmm. that he uh, apparently defiled copies of the quran he was accused of desecrating the quran the prosecution... wait so he did he did he did something like this <laughs> he did something like that yeah very like and that then, and then they 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 prosecuted him yeah life in prison oh. life for that yep for this so you for do that. this, and so you do this, and then you go like that, and then there's life in prison. <laughs> life in prison. Mm. Meanwhile, Western politicians are like, "Hey, it works so well over there. Why can't we have it here?" Exactly. Uh, yeah, eight. They had eight witnesses that uh, that Ali Haider had desecrated the pages of the Quran, just like you just did, and uh, so they called got, for we've conviction. Got way, we've got way more witnesses. They said that the uh, yeah we we got. Uh, Probably a few hundred right now. 630, right? 637 witnesses right now. Nice. And they're going to be more when people watch the video. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably about 20,000. Uh, and so Ali Haider is going to prison for life. But what's noteworthy is, is that there are eight witnesses who says he did it. But the defense pointed out to no avail that nobody reported it to police on the day it happened. So all those eight witnesses that supposedly saw it, they just went about their business hmm. and didn't say a thing about it at the time. Does not sound realistic. We see these mobs just jump into action instantly at the mere thought that someone has done something like this. Indeed. And so I kind of think Ali Haider is innocent. But unfortunately, in Pakistan, he's never going to get a fair shake. Mm -mm. Because even if, he, uh, even if he were freed, even if he were to get out tomorrow, uh, there'd be a mob ready to kill him. Mm -hmm. the accusation we, is enough and yeah and this also is something that goes back to the muslim sources that it's a you basically have a uh license to kill if you simply can accuse someone of doing something like that we got the story in sunan mm -hmm. abu daud where a man killed the mother of his own children as a slave girl but uh she had fathered two kids by him uh the guy stabs her to death the blood runs all over one of her kids uh, then he tosses the body, and then the Muslims gather around the next day, and they're like, ah, who killed this woman who's been brutally stabbed to death? And uh, 
the guy comes forward and says, Muhammad, she insulted you. Muhammad said, oh, no punishment for this guy. This woman insulted me. I mean, keep in mind, it, he could have he killed her for any reason. He could have killed her for the bad falafel or something like this and just walk out there and say, she insulted you, Muhammad. So it's actually in the Muslim sources that this is a way to get away with murder. That guy got away with murder just by mm -hmm. saying, oh, yeah, and she, uh, she insulted you, Muhammad. And so uh, it shouldn't be surprising that even to this day, you don't like someone, just gather a couple of your friends and say, oh, yeah, we all saw him desecrate the Quran. Guy's lucky he got life in prison and not, uh, not just murdered. And pretty soon you're going to be able to do that in Sweden as well. Because Sweden, you have the, uh, that one area, I've already forgotten, Uddevalla, where you can get pork in the schools and the Muslim students are enraged. But Sweden as a whole is going in the other direction. And the evidence of that is that uh, this past week, Swedish prosecutors announced that they were going to put this man, Sawan Momika, and another one, Sawan Najem, on trial for desecrating the Quran in Sweden, which supposedly is in favor of the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, it's no more the case. Now they are going to be prosecuted. Uh, they are not native Swedes, so they could be deported. Senior prosecutor Anna Hankio said both men are prosecuted for having on four occasions made statements and treated the Quran in a manner intended to express contempt for Muslims because of their faith. Now, David, that's just false. I know enough. I've read Sawan Monika's tweets. Yeah, and look what they look what they did. They made it about Muslims because they mm -hmm. want to they want to explain this as some sort of uh, racism or something. Even though guy's not Swedish, right? Um, so they they but they have to do that. So they can't make it that he's showing contempt for the ideas and for the ideology. Uh, which calls for his violent subjugation and calls for the ideology calls for him to be executed for blasphemy and so on. And what's the position of Sweden? You just have to keep your mouth shut about it. If this, mm -hmm. if, if you have all these guys who want to kill you, shut your mouth. Under no circumstances do you express your contempt for that ideology. And I have to say, you know, I don't want these guys getting deported because we know we know what that would mean. I am looking forward to these trials to actually like, you know expose what's going on i want the entire mm -hmm. world looking at sweden going you freaking lunatics look at what you're doing look what they've done to you and want that as an example for when we say hey do you know what islam does it actually is, will ch over time change your entire legal system to give islam a privileged status in society no it doesn't do that david you're lying oh really look at sweden yep and remember doug emhoff the second gentleman of the United States, the uh, husband of Vice President Kamala Harris, has promised that there will be soon uh, legislation regarding Islamophobia and the Woo. criminalization of Islamophobia, not just in the UK, but also in the US. Now. Better lock me up now. <laughs> I have to say, jail ain't nothing but brick and steel. I can't hold the dizzle. Yeah. Well, that's good. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, maybe you can show me the ropes or whatever. I don't know how it works. Don't worry. If you get if you get locked up before I do, just go in there. Tell him you tell him you know David Wood. You'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, interesting to note. In just one last final thing, real quick. Uh, everybody always says you know that the Taliban is an extreme version of Islam. It's not the real thing. But it's noteworthy that the Taliban hasn't gotten the memo. And the UN has been condemning them for their uh, rules against women that we talked about last week, that women can't even speak outside the home and so on. And uh, the Taliban has called upon the UN to, quote, refrain from criticisms that insult Islamic values. So the Taliban is accusing the UN of Islamophobia. And uh, it's, 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 it's getting fun out there, ladies and gentlemen. But we have... Uh, I believe we have come to the end. Uh, David, off air, you got to get me your address so I can get you this book so that you can tear it to shreds. Not yeah. literally, though, because we need to talk about it. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that Battle of the Titans is coming up. 
And in the meantime, uh, there will be more jihad next week. There was a whole lot more jihad this week, but I think I, I pers I know people have sometimes said there should be a longer show, but I personally think, ladies and gentlemen, that an hour of jihad every week is plenty. You want more, go to jihadwatch.org. There is, unfortunately, plenty more at jihadwatch.org and documentation of the stories that we've talked about tonight. So we'll be back uh, maybe next week. Maybe not next week, actually. I'm on the road, but probably sometime soon after that, God willing. And until then, pray, hope, and don't worry.